think we kind of got lucky this week because we did not have a snow day on a Thursday. So <laughs> we were still able to do the presentation, which is great. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Molly Harper. I think I recognize pretty much everybody here. So I am part-time artist, leaning towards full-time, and then I also work part-time here at the library. Um, if you had friends or family who couldn't make it tonight, we are recording the presentation, and that will be up on the library's um, YouTube video later on. So um, if you had anybody else that wanted to come out. But um, yeah, I've been wanting to do a presentation here for the library for a little while about my pottery. It started a few years ago kind of as a side project, and then I've kind of gradually moved from working full-time at the library and part-time pottery to now working more full-time pottery and part-time library. Um, so I've kind of got a little bit of an informal presentation, um, and then I've got a couple of quick little demos, and then I do have some items available um, for sale here. If anybody has any questions at all, I'm happy to answer questions at the end as well. So first of all, meet the artist, me. Um, I first got introduced to ceramics during a high school sculpture class. I was taking a class over actually at Guilford High School where I went to school and just fell in love with working with clay. I played on the wheel, I think maybe two classes out of all of high school. We just had this ancient old stoneware kick wheel that you just had to sit there and like wind it up like crazy to get going. So it started out more hand sculpting. When I went to college, I actually studied environmental policy and then took ceramics and art classes on the side to just kind of like calm me down and give me something else to work on. So I don't actually have really a formal education in art. A lot of what I have is self-taught and then kind of miscellaneous classes and experiences I've had. But I would love to kind of go back to school or take more classes. I, I think that it's something that you can always learn more. You can learn more from other potters. You can learn more from other artists. And kind of the pursuit of knowledge never really ends um, if you're an artist. So. Some of the things that I've done is I took a kiln building class at the New Hampshire Institute of Art, which was fascinating. Uh, I actually fire an electric kiln, which is basically a large oven that just gets really, really hot. Um, the gas kiln that I helped build, it's, it's about this big, and you just stick a couple of big propane torches into it and fire that baby up to about 2,000 degrees. And there are a lot more factors involved rather than just, you know, a nice, easy little electric kiln that you press start. So that was a neat class. Um, I've rented studio spaces before, and I actually have my own studio now. So I um, kind of rent a room, I guess, at my mom's house. We took over my old childhood bedroom, gutted it, and turned it into a studio. So I uh, owe a lot of thanks to my mom for putting up with me tracking uh, clay dust throughout mm -hmm. the entire house. And um, she's a big help. So studio rentals kind of evolved into a home studio. I did spend some time two years ago in North Carolina. I took a sculpture class at the Sawtooth School for Visual Arts, and then I also worked for a small local pottery, which was very fun. So right now, I'm kind of in my home studio. I'm focusing on someday moving a studio up to where I actually live. So I live in Springfield, New Hampshire, which is about an hour and 15 minutes away from where my studio is. <laughs> so there's a little bit of a commute. But uh, eventually I'd love to have the studio up and just kind of have my own space. Uh, I learned during a residency this fall that it's really, really helpful to have a studio in the same place that you live. Because sometimes you want to work until 2 AM. Some mornings I want to just get up and go. Other mornings I really don't want to drive for an hour and a half. Um, so kind of long term, I'm looking at moving the studio. This is my little studio. This is where everything happens. And it's about the size of like the library kitchen there. Um, I'd say it's about 12 feet, 12 feet deep, 12 feet square. Um, so I've got a whole rack of shelves that I put all of my, right now they're, they're pretty much full. I have glazeware, fired pieces to be glazed, and then I do have another rack that's kind of over on the right hand side. But that's where all of my work comes out of. So when I'm in production mood, mode like I am right now, it can be a little tough to kind of squeeze everything in. Um, not pictured is my mom's upstairs bathroom that currently has all of my packing supplies in it. Um, <laughs> the tub is full. So the entire tub is full with boxes, bubble wrap, tape. Um, right now, all of my bisqueware, which is the fired pieces, I store in plastic tubs. 
I'm starting a stack of that in the bathroom. Um, so the studio is really, it's, it's grown from where it was when I first started doing the ceramics a few years ago. And now I'm really getting to a point where I'm almost outgrowing my studio, um, which is kind of exciting. So kind of a close up of my wheel. That's how it looks most days. That's a trimming day. Um, trimming days, I just get clay everywhere. Um, I also get clay everywhere when my two-year-old niece comes over to help. So that's her. I, I taught her how to do reclaim. So reclaim, um, I recycle a lot of my, my clay trimmings and she likes to take all the broken out dry pieces and just rehydrate them for me. And um, Very helpful. Um, kind of the average production day, that's about what I throw per day, sometimes more, sometimes less, but I try to fill about a rack a day, um, I kind of have like a monetary figure in my head that I try to like achieve, you know, a certain amount. Um, right now, I've kind of gotten into a good habit of throwing for a couple days, then trimming for a couple days, then firing for a couple days, and then resetting on Sundays and working again. But it's definitely kind of been interesting moving from working full time at a place like a public library to working pretty much full time for myself. Um, there's definitely a learning curve where you realize that you can't sleep in until 11 o'clock every day and you have to actually start, you know, taking the job seriously. But uh, production's starting to ramp up. And then down in the lower picture is actually a new, new wheel I bought myself. So that was a uh, Craigslist find. It is about 30 years older than I am. So I'm really excited to kind of play around with that. Um, it was originally made in Japan and then shipped to the US and it is heavy. I was going to bring it here with me tonight and do a demo, but one, it's heavy, and two, we just got three feet of snow that I'm not carrying that through. <laughs> so we didn't get the wheel here tonight, but I do have two wheels now, which is nice because when I really start expanding the studio, I'll be able to kind of work on one with wet work, work on the other with dry work. And then in the upper right-hand corner, does anybody here know Wendy O'Ellers? She does Dreamscape Jewelry Design. Um, she's a really, really talented jeweler. She has generously let me use her photo booth a number of times. So the studio really has kind of expanded outside of just the house and being able to use fellow artists' work, um, workspaces has been really, really helpful because I don't have space for my own photography area. She has a clean, ceramic, dust-free room, <laughs> which is helpful. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> um, one of the cool things that I got last summer was a wheel, or a kiln. I started out with the first kiln on the right, and that was well, probably six years ago now, maybe. Um, that was a Craigslist find. Somebody had it, and they were just getting rid of it. And so I was able to dry that and pick that one up. And it's, it's about 15 inches in diameter workspace on the inside. So that works really well for birches, which are tall and skinny but not so well for bowls and plates and larger items. So I was able to get a second kiln. My aunt down in Key Largo actually had a kiln that she didn't use. So I shipped that up and now I have two kilns that I can operate. One that's tall and skinny and one that's kind of shorter and wider. So now I can do larger pieces like the large birch bowl, some of the other larger pieces, and then hopefully kind of as I work on skills and try out new ideas, I can make much larger pieces big kiln so that was that was a really exciting development last summer um, that was kind of the first like yeah big studio investment and got a second kiln showed up and um, so those are both stored up in my dad's barn right now so I don't fire those in the house because when you're firing a kiln you do get a lot of off gassing so I have to make sure that those stay in an area that's pretty open and pretty um, pretty airy the downside is that every time I go to bring my pieces, I bring them downstairs, out through the dining room, onto the porch, across the driveway, up the hill, into the barn. <laughs> and that's every, I, I usually pull a pallet. So I'll, I'll have um, like a two inch or two foot by one foot boards that I carry everything out on. And yeah, you just kind of go down the stairs like this the entire time and pray that somebody's there to hold the door for you. So the studio is it's working well, kind of for, for a hobby potter, but I'd love to be able to expand and kind of make a studio that works a little bit better um, and that you can be a little bit more productive in the future. So some of my inspiration uh, definitely comes from the natural world. 
I think part of that is just growing up in the woods of New Hampshire and growing up in Gilmanton, which is, I think, just a beautiful, beautiful place. Where I live now in Springfield is also very rural. I'm out off of 4A and I just have woods in my backyard. Um, so a lot of what I do is just the, the tree, tree inspired or bark inspired. Um, I think a lot of that also comes from environmental studies that learning about different environmental issues really made me more aware of the, the natural world. And I'd love to kind of work work a little bit more of that education into my pieces or do some like one-off political pieces sometime. A lot of what I do right now is functional and I'd love to get into a realm where I could try doing a little bit more sculptural, a little bit, you know, kind of loosening up and having some fun with it and figuring out ways that I could combine my education with my love of art. Um, definitely inspired by family. So the idea for the birches I actually can't take credit for. My sister was the one who came up with that. When I was living down in North Carolina, I called her up one time and was just kind of really missing home. It's, it's a long way from New Hampshire. And she told me, she said, oh, well, you know, while you're down there, you should try making like some white birches. And Cassidy, uh, my sister, loves birch trees. And it's like, okay, I'll, I'll try making you a birch out of clay, Cass. I don't, I don't know how I'm gonna make a tree out of clay. But that turned into kind of a little project that I just got to focus on while I was down there. And that steadily evolved into just doing birches now. So it's kind of fun. I, um, I frequently remind her that she could have picked an easier tree <laughs> than a birch tree. But um, it is kind of fun though, because I know that every time I look at it, I think of being in North Carolina and just kind of missing my family and missing my sister. And also, you know, it reminds me of home. It reminds me of New Hampshire. Um, it's also always evolving. Every time I make birches, I change little things. Every time I make glazes, I change things. And you know, it's every season things will kind of evolve. I know some people here, I think, have some work for me from like two or three years ago at my very, very first farmer's market that is very different from what I have now. And I'm always looking to kind of evolve and change things up. Um, I love experimenting. Um, and I'm excited to kind of see how things go. So. Birches, um, probably one of the things that's most popular right now. It's been interesting kind of figuring out what works, what doesn't work. I started doing a little bit more with functional wear and dinner wear, trying out some mugs, trying out some cups. Um, the outside of the birches are actually porous because they're not glazed, so that makes it a little bit tricky if you're doing functional wear because they'll absorb water. Um, you have to be a little bit more careful with raw clay, but I love the look of it so much that I'm willing to kind of work with it and see what I can do. Um, so mostly what I've been doing is vases and then starting to get into some more mugs and bowls and um, that's an experiment that I think I'm going to continue this fall and continue this summer is just seeing kind of how far I can push that medium and what else I can do with the birches. And it's just a really fun texture to do. All right. Kind of got caught off, but um, October. If anybody was in the library looking for me in October, I was long gone. I went up to a ceramics residency up in Maine, um, it was up in Newcastle, Maine. And the idea behind a residency is to basically give artists this dedicated time where they can just sit and focus on a certain medium, sit and focus on a certain idea, but you just get to really dedicate your time towards working on a project. And for me, I really wanted to go and try a residency both to see if ceramics was something that I was able to do and wanted to do 100% full time week to week. And also just to give myself finally a chance to, to focus on these things, focus on these ideas that I had and try out some new things that it's a little hard to kind of experiment when you're working 40 hours and commuting an hour and a half and in the studio and trying all these shows. And this was four weeks where I could do nothing but ceramics. Um, Watershed is a really neat place. I would definitely recommend anyone interested in art classes or ceramics classes to check out Watershed because for one, it's gorgeous. Um, that was the view from my front porch. So I lived in a cabin, there were eight other people up there, um, everybody ranging from ceramic artists, we had a couple of photographers, uh, a couple of other visual artists, and a really, really diverse group. Uh, 
next door was an organic farm that did a farmer's market every Wednesday night. So you could just go over and get all of your fresh produce. Um, the pigs were on the walkway down to the studio. So you could literally every morning reach over and like scratch little pigs on their head. And then the studio is, um, it's a refurbished old brick factory and it's huge. I don't have many pictures of the scale of this building, but it's probably, I would say it's probably is this two, two, maybe even three libraries long. Um, it's an enormous building. It looks tiny from out front, but it's easily, easily twice the length of the library this way. Um, and then also two story. So this was my workspace upstairs. Um, so I was able to just kind of set up a workspace. They pretty much like opened up a room and then said, make whatever you want. So all eight of us went in there and dragged tables around and just built our own workspaces. And um, you could just sit there and look out the window and just work. And it was a really, a really exciting time for me because it was the first time that I got to <laughs> play around with glaze experimentation. So glazing, um, glazing is an interesting experience because all of the glazes that I've used really before have been commercial glazes. So they've come in a bottle, ready to go. In college, I did a little bit of glaze mixing, but not a lot of experimenting. This was pretty much, they have a room the size of this meeting room filled with chemicals, and you can do whatever you want. So there was a lot of kind of Googling recipes, seeing what I could come up with, and then just doing some trials. So in the lower picture, um, I always said that I felt like I was like making meth or something because you just have this great big mask and you're all bundled up and you're sitting there measuring out all these like little like freaky white powders. Um, but at the end of it, you come up with really beautiful glazes. So um, these were three of the glazes that I came up with that I was super excited about. So I have a blue, a green, and a cream color that all ended up being used this fall and this winter for some of the pieces that I made. So. Any of the stump pieces that I have over there were made with watershed glazes. Um, and it was just, it was really cool. It was an interesting experience because I, being in a very small studio, the idea of having this like massive, massive resource of all these chemicals, all these colorants, all these kilns that you can play with, it's just not something that I've had access to before. So that was really exciting. And then in the upper corner, that's a show of my Tetra skills. I was able to fit absolutely everything on the floor there in one little kiln in the corner. Um, so that was another thing was like learning efficiency and learning that, you know, when you're paying for every single firing, you make the most out of it and you really pack everything in. Um, so that was, that was a lot of work. Um, and I got quite a bit of stuff done. I got a lot of experimenting done. I probably would have been happy to stay there for another month. <laughs> um, but it was a good experience and it really, it helped me to realize that to, to sit there and do nothing but ceramics for 12 hours a day was something that I could really see myself doing and it was something that I, I finished the end of the day tired but feeling really good and feeling excited and feeling like I had been able to make something and express myself and um, being able to sit and like look at a view like that of the wild turkeys hanging out in your front yard and like sitting in the sunshine in the middle of October. Um, you know, I think the setting definitely helped because it is a beautiful place, but it really, really made me feel like I was on the right path. I think that knowing that I was coming back and leaving the library full time, maybe not coming back at all, and then just focusing on the art. Um, it's a big scary change, but it yeah. definitely made me feel like I could do it and I, I was excited about it. Uh, that was my poor car <laughs> on the way back. Um, I made the mistake of ordering clay on my way back. I get all of my clay and glazes and supplies from Portland Pottery up in Portland, Maine. So it's pretty fun. We take a drive up, we hit up Whole Foods for lunch, there's a donut place up there that we like to check out. So every time I do a supply run, I go up and, you know, restock on all the other good stuff. But I ordered, I think, 250 or 300 pounds of clay that I plan to pick up on the way back from the residency, <laughs> not thinking about the fact that I already had, you know, several hundred pounds of stuff in my car. So 
what it doesn't show is just how low the bumper was. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm pretty good at filling up my car. I just uh, I just put another 700 pounds of clay in last week, um, so I've got it's it's a good little car. It really carries it. But I go through about, depending on the week, 50 to 75 pounds of clay throw in per week. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's a little bit less. Um, so it's a lot of clay. I, it goes through a lot of clay, but I do try to recycle as much as possible. So like the buckets over here, that's clay recycling that was being reprocessed. And it's just a lot easier. And I think I like the idea of just taking scraps from one piece and turning it into fresh clay to make another one. And the way I actually do my pieces is I use the fresh, nice, like perfect clay for the birches. And then all the gunk gets re-wedged, put back together, and then that's what I use for the stump bowls, because then if it's a little wonky, if you've got some bubbles in there or something, I think it's kind of a fun technique, and it's a fun clay to work with when I'm doing the, the, the stump bowls a little bit, but the birches definitely, those get the nice, nice brand new clay. So moving forward a little bit, this is, um, this is where I live. This is my little cabin. Um, so it was my mom's camp that she had up in Springfield, and when I moved back from North Carolina, we decided to fix it up, and now I live there. So thinking about it, living here and then having the commute has definitely been trying, especially as an emerging artist, especially somebody who's really just getting started as a full-time artist. Um, it's a tough way to make a living, and it's really tough when you're driving three hours a day, and all your proceeds are going into the gas tank. Um, so eventually the goal would definitely be to put the studio up here because it's it's a beautiful place I, I love where i live and how can you not be inspired by you know the trees and the, the, just the beauty around it so um, i have space here that i could put a couple of kilns in i have another building that's just down the hill that i could put a studio in so kind of working working forward and always kind of thinking about what i could do to make a studio more efficient and work better for me and i think Having lived at Watershed and doing the residency, being able to wake up in the morning and like walk to the studio while drinking your first cup of coffee and then be immediately ready to work is extremely helpful. So definitely uh, focusing on moving forward and moving, moving up to Springfield with the studio would be nice. Um, so then just a couple of like kind of quick pictures. Those are the three glazes that I came up with at Watershed. Um, so I was really happy with all of those. The lower picture was a kind of fun project I did last year for an old high school friend where we actually designed a dinnerware set and she used it as her registry for her, um, her wedding. So people would contact me and purchase certain pieces or um, different things like that. But it was, it was fun to do something different and to design a completely different set than something that's not tree related, not birch related. But to do something really personal, because I, I find that I do like making making things special for people and customizing in different ways, and that was kind of a fun project. Um, also moving forward in the top picture, uh, after about like the 700th birch, you get a little tired of looking at them. So I was trying to come up with ways to make them a little bit more, a little more different, a little more interesting, and a little more fun. I think to work on. So. I'm gonna start adding mushrooms to some of them. I'm gonna start adding branches to some of them. I'm just trying to figure out something, something different, something that kind of makes it pop in a different way. Because some of the birches, it's the same style that I've had for a couple of years and a couple shows now. And one thing I've learned is to, you know, if you have a core group of things that people really like, that's good. But you know, people always want to know what's new. They want to know what else you're coming up with. And, you do kind of get bored of making the same thing again and again and again and again and again. So I think doing mushrooms and adding some branches uh, will be something kind of fun for the summer. And then my end goal, um, last year the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen did an open doors event and the location up in Meredith actually featured me as their emerging artist, which was really exciting because that has always been one of my goals is to be a League of New Hampshire Craftsman potter. I've just always kind of grown up admiring the work that was up there and just being so blown away by the quality and the standards that they have. And this was a little display in the league for just a couple of hours for the Emerging Artist Day. And it's kind of become my benchmark to just keep, 
keep pushing with my stuff and keep working and get it to a point where I could get into the league. Um, I did have a review for the league last year and I was deferred, so it wasn't a refusal. They had some kind of changes and recommendations that they wanted me to work on, which is something I'm going to be working on this spring and this summer. And then I have another jury review in October. So fingers crossed. Um, I'm hoping that kind of the mushrooms and the branches and something a little more and something a little different will kind of help get me there. But that was uh, one day that was really exciting because it just kind of made me feel like, you know, I could be a league potter and um, just really exciting. So that's, that's, that's the big goal is to hopefully get up there, um, maybe someday open up my own studio where I can teach classes. Um, I get a lot of questions about teaching and I would love to be able to do that. I, I love just kind of helping people discover how fun ceramics can be. Um, so I don't know, maybe I'll get a couple more wheels and do a class here sometime or something. It would be kind of fun. Um, I think the formatting on this one got a little funny, but I have work at a couple of different shops in New Hampshire so far, and then I just picked up another store in Rutland, Vermont that's going to be carrying some of my pieces. So they're right off of Route 4. They should be starting to carry them in May. Um, and then I have some work at a gallery in Michigan, which was kind of cool. I was contacted by a woman who owns a gallery, and she was doing a project to raise awareness about invasive species that are eating a lot of the birch trees and killing the birch trees in the Upper mm -hmm. Peninsula. So she just kind of did an online search for artists who worked with birch bark and found my stuff. So that was that was kind of a neat thing. It's like, yeah, I'll, I'll send some stuff out for you know an invasive species awareness campaign. Um, so that's how I got Michigan. So other than that, I have um, Franklin Studio. The one in the middle is 50 Home, which is on North Main Street in Concord. is a great place. Um, everything that she has is made in the United States, and she has worked in all 50 states, which is kind and then Riverview Artisans just opened in September, um, and they are up in Bristol. The woman who owns that is the same woman who used to curate the gallery at the Squirrel Lake Natural Science Center. Um, summer and fall shows, I've got a lot lined up for pretty much from May onward. I'm kind of in a lull right now, which has been kind of nice. But uh, starting, I think Mother's Day weekend is my first event, and then I just kind of take off from there. So I've got things kind of all around New England or all around the Lakes region. Um, haven't quite branched into Maine or Vermont or Mass yet, but I'd love to maybe a couple years down the, the road start branching out. But for now, um, that's where I am. I do also have a website. I am working on possibly someday getting a store um, up on the website. Right now, I'm just building inventory but hopefully, kind of down the road, I'll have some work up on up online. And then if you're on Facebook or Instagram, I do have Soul Pine Pottery on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and then my contact info. So um, maybe I'll turn on a couple of lights and then I have just a couple of like kind of quick little demonstrations and I'll talk about some of the tools and then I'll leave plenty of time for people to kind of ask some questions. Does anybody have any questions before I get started on tools? So while we say you get the, the clay from Portland, yep. where does Portland get it from? I mean, do they go dig and get at some kind of a quarry? They don't. So what I do is I use clay that's produced by Standard Ceramics, which is, um, I want to say it's mined and it's, it's put together in Pennsylvania. Um, and then Portland carries clay from three different companies, I think. So it's not local clay. I could probably search it out and see if I could find some like local earthenware clay. Um, local clay fires very differently from commercial clay. It's a lot more unpredictable. So I, I could I could go right down and I could dig up clay at Guilford Beach and try to you know make something with it. But um, I use the commercial clay just because you it's a lot more predictable. I know I know how it's going to turn out well, every well, time. Will the local clay have like minerals or sediment in it that will change the color? When you, It'll when change you the color. It, it will sometimes cause the pieces to crack. You really you have to filter local clay heavily, um, where commercial clay is very smooth. This is almost like throwing with cream cheese. Um, there's not a lot of roughness. There's not a lot of uh, 
kind of junk in it. Um, I did throw with some local clay actually up at Watershed, which was an experience. Um, because as you're throwing, your hands will just kind of catch on stuff and then you're mm -hmm. pulling like chunks of root, you're pulling little <laughs> rocks, you're pulling pieces of mica. Um, local clay is really, it's, it's very, very neat, but for a production point of view, it's a little tough to work with. What about if you took local clay and sifted it through a screen? You <laughs> could. So you don't get the roots in a little time. time. You that could. Like you. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's a whole field of ceramics um, that kind of deals with harvesting and processing local clay. Um, I don't know as much about it. It's a completely different feel. Um, you'll never be able to get that clay digging in the woods in New Hampshire. Um, because the, there's a lot of other things that go into making a clay body. Um, so my clay body has like two or three different types of clay that's been finely bought, milled. It has silica in it. It has you know, talc in it. It has a lot of other chemicals that go into the clay body itself that help keep it white and strong and flexible and firing at a certain temperature. Um, but at Watershed, it was kind of cool to like experiment with with local clay for the first time and it's it's very rough um, it really tears your hands up too that was something that I found that this clay is um, really nice and smooth so my clay it's if you've ever seen stoneware clay that's like kind of rough on the bottom maybe some like old mugs or anything that you have um, that usually has it has like less fine particles that they'll kind of tear up your hands a little bit if you're a wheel thrower with them. So I kind of babied out and I got nice smooth clay. Um, so it is a stoneware clay, so it's not like a porcelain that's super, super thin and super fine. Um, it's a stoneware clay, so it's really nice and sturdy. Um, it's not gonna warp a lot in the kiln. It's not gonna kind of do funny things, but it also doesn't make me look like I've been throwing with a cheese grater. So I, I kind of like that. But, um, Kind of like brief looking at some of the tools I use. These are all the tools that I use. Um, I have some different sizes of different things, but for the most part, this is what I throw with. This is what I trim with. This is what I texture with. This is what I color with. Um, everything that I do in the studio all comes in different processes. So I'll throw a bunch, I'll trim a bunch, I'll texture a bunch, and just try to keep it all at different stages because the challenge with clay is depending on the humidity, depending on the weather, depending on how wet it was when you made it, this will either dry out in two hours or four days. So you have to be really aware of what stage of the, the clay is at. So this is at what I would call like leather hard right now. So it's still, it's kind of cool to the touch. You can feel it a little bit. It's cool to the touch, but it's not what we call bone dry. So there's still some moisture in it. This is a good clay because I can still work with this right now. If it dries out and it's bone dry and it's kind of that powdery white color, it's impossible to work with. It's impossible to do a lot of texturing with. But this is like perfect for trimming. Um, usually it's a little wetter than this when I start doing some of the other texturing, but nice. it's been sitting in my car for a little while. So that's leather hard. So that's part of Part of the studio is just constantly managing what stage your clay is at so that you can trim it. So um, the question in the summertime, do you have to work faster because of the temperature and the humidity? Um, actually, no. It's funny, in the wintertime, things will dry out a lot more fast in my studio because in the summer, there's more moisture in the air, so it doesn't evaporate off my pieces as much. So it's um, not from the heat? It's not always from the heat. It's more humidity. Um, if it's very humid, your pieces will stay wet forever. When I was in North Carolina, my pieces would never dry. And you'd sit there with a hair dryer on them. Get back to New Hampshire, and the house where the studio is in is um, heated with wood heat. So wood heat is very, very dry. So this, the house itself is very dry. So if I left this out uncovered, it would probably be bone dry by the end of my work day. Um, so you really have to kind of be careful. Um, but in the summertime, it's a little bit more humid and you don't have to worry. But lots of plastic, lots of spray bottles. Um, so as far as throwing, if I had my wheel, I'd show you throwing. Um, if not, just Google throwing videos and you will spend hours on YouTube. Um, 
But a lot of the tools that I have, these are ribs. So ribs are for kind of texturing and compressing the sides of the pieces. If I do a piece that has shape or flair to it, the ribs are used for that. Um, I like to compress the outsides of my pieces a lot because I really want them to show up nice and white when I finish. And when I show you kind of how I do the black, it'll make sense that the smoother the outside of your piece is, the much easier it is to get that like clean, crisp finish. So I love ribs. I've got, this one's my favorite. I have it in three colors. <laughs> um, so a lot of tools. I'm, I'm kind of a, a tool junkie. Every time I go up to Portland Pottery, I just want more and more. Um, so some of my favorite ones, like pot lifters, after you throw a piece and you want to lift it off the wheel, I could just go for it and pick it up with my hands. But when I'm working with some of the really tall pieces, if you pick it up with your hands, the weight of the piece is going to alter it. But pot lifters, I can just come in, scoop it up, move it over, and I'm good to go. So. Just the tools, um, I always, this is from uh, my dare ruler from like third grade. <laughs> um, you know, you recycle a lot of things, but those are my throwing tools. Um, trimming, trimming comes after you've let your pieces kind of set up and dry for a little while. I'll let them dry out to leather hard, and then you flip them over upside down on the wheel, and then I finish the bottoms. So when I do my pieces, kind of my signature, is to finish the bottom so that they look like the growth rings on a tree. And that's something that comes at the trimming stage. And I go through a lot of these little tools. It's a little rake tool. So it's flat on one side and then it's serrated with teeth on the other side. So once the pieces are ready to fire, I flip them upside down. This is the greatest tool known to man. Um, it's called a Giffen and Grip. This has saved my life. <laughs> so what this does is it snaps onto the top of my wheel head and you take your piece, you put it upside down, and then it has these little arms that are on tracks. So the trick when you're trimming is you don't want your piece to wobble, you don't want it to move, because if you think about your wheel is going to be spinning, 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 spinning. So if you have something in the middle of something that's spinning, where does it want to go? Yeah. So this holds it centered in the middle of the wheel. So once it's on the wheel, I can get it to tighten up. It has these little adjustable arms that you just squeeze in from all sides. And then, <laughs> oh, 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 oops, sometimes it works. Um, it didn't get tight enough. But anyway, in theory, that's how that would work. <laughs> but um, these little arms are wonderful because you can get these in all different heights. So if I go to trim something like this, to trim the top of this, if you're putting weight up here, this is going to get really wobbly really quick. But I have nine inch arms that can come up and they just squeeze right onto the side of that so I can focus just on the top of this without it worrying about tipping over. So the gift and grip just it it takes the trimming process and it cuts it into thirds. So what I would do from that after it gets all tightened down and you know secured, um, I use that really well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I was thinking like you know when you go to Dairy Queen they make your furry and then like they flip it upside down, but these the, yeah. Anyway, um, trimming is one of my favorite things to do. I think partially because of the gift and grip. Usually when you're trimming, it's it's not as much fun as throwing because it's a lot of just like kind of shaping and taking extra clay off. But when you have the gipping grip, you just kind of like spin it real quick and then you don't have to worry about anything. Um, but I use a lot of different types of tools. So I've got these little loop tools, um, my little rake tools, and then I have a shredder. This thing is fantastic because basically as the wheel is spinning, I can just take this, hold it against the side of my piece, and then it takes off a huge amount of clay at a time as it's spinning. So you have all this clay that's coming off. I'll then take this and recycle this. So I let it dry out until it's bone dry, crush it up into powder again. You know, use my niece. She's pretty good at like <laughs> rehydrating everything. But that type of tool just works really good to just very, very, very quickly change the shape of the outsides of your pieces. So if you picture this spinning around very quickly, 
I mean, you can you can shape it in seconds with that tool. I'll go in, finish up the bottom. So I'll kind of cut cut a little bit of a groove in and even out and flatten out the bottom, and then use these little teeth to put those growth rings in. Um, I don't know why I started doing it. I just kind of like I did it one time, and it reminded me of the growth rings of the tree, and then that kind of evolved into doing the um, the tree themed pieces. So kind of fun. Another step of this is always compressing the outside again and again and again. So that's what these little ribs are good for. Um, and they're kind of fun. So I've got these in three different flexibilities. So red is super flexible, green not so much, and then the blue is really stiff. But if you're holding something super stiff, even like a credit card you could use against the side of the piece, that compresses and smooths all the particles of the piece down so then it's super, super soft. It's really, really slippery, um, which comes in handy for when you do the coloring stage. Um, after I get the pieces pretty much trimmed and I'm happy with how they look, I go on to do the knot holes. So knot holes is probably one of my favorite stages because you can just kind of have fun with it. Basically, I start out just kind of scribbling the basic shape of a knot hole. So, very, very basic line work. And then I come in with a ball tool. So I've got ball tools in three different sizes. So it varies depending on the size of the birch that I'm doing. If I'm doing something very large, I'll use the big guy. Otherwise, I use the small ones because I kind of, I try to make the knot holes proportional to the size of the piece that I'm doing. Um, that was one of the things from the uh, um, review for the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, they said, you know, your, your texturing is interesting, but your proportions are off, that you've got a little piece like this with a knot hole on it, you know, that almost covers the whole side. So something I kind of learned and I'm adjusting. But doing the actual knot holes is just kind of fun because you start out with that little texture and then you just kind of come in and literally just push from the inside out and depending on the wetness of the clay, this is one of those things that you'll get better knot holes depending on whether or not it's humid out. It splits mm -hmm. the clay apart. So Can you hold that up just a little bit more into there? Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to show it. So that just kind of cracks oh. the surface of the clay apart. Then you have to smooth the inside. I don't always. I'll kind of go in with my finger a little bit and smooth it. Um, I'll have to check it. Yeah. <laughs> Quality control. control. Even inside the little pieces. Even inside the little pieces. Yep. Yeah. How do you do that? Um, long I mean, your hand isn't going to fit in. Nope, but the tools do. So okay. the trickiest ones, um, the big guys are nice and easy. I love doing the big ones, and I love doing these little tiny ones. These ones can be a little tough because how do I kind of get, get mm -hmm. in there? Um, part of it is this was 15 to 20 percent larger before I fired it so this will shrink down about half an inch in all dimensions so clay depending on the clay you use and depending on the water content um, there's usually like a 10 10 to 18 percent shrinkage rate depending on the clay body mine's about 15 percent um, so that helps this was larger when I was texturing it the other thing is these little tools so I can kind of get to the inside and just like you know strategically push them out that way but um, the little ones are definitely more of a challenge than the tall ones the tall ones I can just stick my hand in there and pretty much do it with my fingers but the little ones um, long tools help those ones I also tend to texture when they're a little bit more wet because then all I need is a little bit of pressure and that's usually enough to to make that move so that's what kind of gives me the start of that. I also, I think I forgot my, my uh, brush, but this is slip. So slip is like a Greek yogurt consistency clay. So I make my own slip by grinding up all of this stuff. I'll let it dry out and then grind it to a powder, add a little bit of water, and then you get this really nice, like thick, sticky gunk. What I like about it, is that it's awesome for texturing. So this is what really gives me the texture that you see coming out along the black on the pieces. It's not just pushing from the outside. 
it's this super sticky st slip that I call it a stick up slip because it kind of sticks up these little peaks when you work with it. And that's just from having, you know, a decent amount of water in it and then really, really fine particles. So I do you would keep, a, do you keep a, a pieces of real wood, the real, a, a lot around you? Yep. So that you can, yeah, I had. I do. I actually yeah. I have pieces with my favorite knot holes. There's this one yes. little piece that I have that's got like a, I mean, it just has the perfect shape for a knot hole. So that's usually one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, I've got some long pieces. I'm always collecting bark, but um, yeah, you, you, I definitely have a lot in my studio, especially when it came to like doing some of these branches um, yes. and doing the mushrooms. I had a log covered in mushrooms sitting on my my counter sure. in front of me. And, I look at them a lot when I'm doing the coloring too, because um, that's one of those things yeah. that I've been kind of working on more is playing with the colors and playing with how the texture looks, but getting the eyes of the birches to look just right. Um, some of my earlier birches, I just kind of did like a blob on the side, but now I'm really working on getting that angle because when you have these black spots on the birches, what they are is it's what's left behind from where a branch used to be. So where the branch was there, you think about it's black because the water discolored the way that the bark looks. So having those like stream patterns on either side, having that darkness, it's not always just because that's how birches grow. It's from where um, there was either a scar or a branch or something on the tree that collected and diverted the water and discolored it. So thinking about that and thinking about that in regards to putting the little branches on, it's like, oh, okay, it can't just be this black blob on the side of a, of a birch tree. It's, it's definitely, it's grown in a specific way for a specific purpose. Yeah. So something that's kind of learning about paying, paying more attention. When I first started doing the birches, they looked way different from how they do now. Um, I meant to find a picture, but uh, mom will attest, they, uh, they look way better now than the first ones that I did. Um, but it's it's just it's a process of learning. It's a process of always evolving and it's fun to see how you learn. Yeah, you know? yeah, and it's it's fun where like every once in a while something will come out of the kiln and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's 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 exactly what I'm going for. And um, when mom came upstairs after I had finished putting the branches and the mushrooms on, I was flat, practically floating around the room. I'm like, but look, I mean, like look at the little the, the mushrooms. <laughs> that's so cool. Um, <laughs> So it is, it's always kind of experimenting and it's, it's fun. You've got to have fun while you're doing it. And I definitely have days where, you know, you sit there and you're like, I have to make 30 birches today. But um, finding ways to kind of mix it up or like changing the way I make the moss or changing the way that I make the pieces helps keep that interesting. Um, I made mugs because I was born with making cylinders. I made branches because I was born with making mugs. Um, so having a short attention span kind of helps with that too. <laughs> um, another one of my favorite stages is the peeling stage. So the peeling stage is really, really, really dependent upon how wet the clay is. Um, if it's nice and dry, you're not going to get the best peels. If it's too wet, you're not going to get the best peels. So you're trying. I try to peel it when it's about leather hard or about the consistency of like a bar of chocolate. Think about a Hershey's bar, a bar of chocolate. Because um, you want to be able to kind of get that curl up a little bit without just putting the tool in and having the piece mush out on you. So that's definitely been another thing that I've learned a lot. Um, my first peels were literally just a pattern where I just kind of like gouged into the side and was like, mm, let's peel. Um, where now I'm starting to almost over peel them and they get very, very fragile. So I've got to kind of dial back and find a happy medium between like, oh, it's peeling and, you know, being a little bit more careful. So to do the peels, I have these just kind of squared off pieces. I keep them very, very sharp. Um, I sharpen all of my tools every single day before I go to use them. Um, because otherwise a, a dull tool just it doesn't work so I keep them super super sharp if I have a long period of trimming or a long period of texturing I'll be sharpening in between um, that was one thing that I figured out up at watershed it's just oh, like I 
can't, my stuff is just not coming out the way I wanted it to, and it was because my trimming tools had finally gotten dull. So keeping things sharp. Um, I usually start with the biggest one just because I like making the big peels first. And it's basically just like peeling a potato. So you just kind of come in from the side at a little bit of an angle, just enough. And I have a hand on the inside of the piece so that I can feel how deep I'm carving. And I'll feel, I, I can feel the clay start to move if I'm starting to go through. And I'll either push back with my finger or finish that peel and say, okay, I can't go any deeper than that. But that just kind of starts starts getting that peel going. Um, some days pieces peel really, 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 really well. Other days, not so much. Um, so it's always kind of fun to like go in and see if this is gonna be a peel happy day or a peel frustrated day. Some pieces will get like a thousand peels because I just sit there and just keep going and going and going and then realize that I haven't changed pieces. Um, where other ones are a little drier, but I figure all trees are a little different, so all of my pieces are very different. But I'll start with the big ones. I'll kind of come back in and, you know, ruffle the edges a little bit, bend it up a little. Some of these are a little bit too far out from the piece. Um, I want to show that they peel and I want to show that they have that texture without it being like a half inch straight out uh, because then that becomes a hazard. Um, but then coming back in with the smaller tools, I can go back, texture some more, and just kind of add add little bits um, and this is when having the birch trees right in front of me really helps too that some birch trees will peel off great big huge swaths at a time other ones or younger ones you get more little tiny tiny little indents that go so uh, just another thing i'm always always kind of playing around with it and always changing it a little bit but that gives me the peel texture so i've got my knot holes i've got my peels um, I skipped a step. The little lines are something that are put in during the trimming process. After I compress the sides really, 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 really heavily, I have a little tiny, 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 tiny loop tool. And every single one of those lines is individually. So, um, yeah, that's another labor intensive, but I tried using a tool to do it, but it didn't it didn't give me the look that I was going for. So I found that I'd much rather have pieces that are really carefully made, really, you know, a lot of detail, a lot of focus on them, rather than just kind of mass producing an identical piece. Um, but that's that's one of the non-fun stages of trimming, which is probably why I didn't mention it, is just sitting there and trying to make it so that you don't have a line that all lines up. You want to really leave it varied, but that's that little little tiny one. Is it spinning when you do that? Yes. Yep. So it's spinning around on the wheel, and then I basically just like sit there like this, and just like make the lines all the way down the piece. Um, so varying the speed of the wheel um, will help because if I just go at the same speed, you end up kind of getting a rhythm with your hand, and then you stop the piece, and all your lines are in these like you know they all match so varying the speed of the wheel varying kind of where on the wheel or where on the piece of carving um, definitely helps but yeah that's that's not a fun stage i don't really like that stage <laughs> oh, i'm sorry i'm oh, sorry so after these pieces are done i let them dry um, when they're completely bone dry then i fire when they come out of the first firing they're this nice beautiful crisp white I am working on figuring out a clay body that I can use where the pieces would stay this white because after the second firing, they do change color a little bit. Can you see? Yeah, they, yeah there we go. So they do change color. And that's partially because I'm working with a stoneware clay, which has more impurities than if I was working with, say, like a pure porcelain or bone china. But the limits to what the material can do changes with the type of clay. So something like bone china or like a porcelain, I may or may not be able to get the height that I get with those. I may or may not be able to stretch it and warp it the way that I do with these pieces. So it's kind of a something I'm working on, something I'd, I'd love to be able to get some like really nice stark white birches. Um, 
But for now, I think that's pretty close. Usually, they're usually a little bit more gray. It's more the young, young, young ones, I think, that are the, the white birch, the paper birch. So um, kind of something, something I kind of keep in the back of my mind that maybe playing with some different clay. I do have a stark white porcelain at home that I am um, going to work on playing with this summer. But my worry is that like, if throwing with this clay is like throwing with cold cream cheese, throwing with porcelain is like throwing with Greek yogurt. Um, it's very slippery. It's um, a beautiful clay, but it's harder, I think, for beginners like myself to get get that height. Um, where with stoneware, stoneware just kind of it's like throwing or building something with sand is porcelain. Building something with gravel is stoneware. If that makes sense. So the size, the size and the shape of the materials um, involved in the clay body makes a difference with what you can build with it. Um, so for porcelain, a plate would be easier. A plate? Yes and no. Um, a plate could be easier, but porcelain, because it has a lot of really fine particles, it likes to warp and it likes to kind of move. Where a plate, you've got a long, wide, flat surface that a little bit of a warp shows up a lot more on a plate than it does on a tall piece. Um, but there are, I mean, there's porcelain artists out there who can sit down and throw a piece like this. Um, it's all kind of a matter of practice. Um, and that's something I haven't had a chance to really practice with porcelain yet, but um, it's another one of those things that I just, I wanna learn, I wanna try something different. And porcelain is on that list. It's a little intimidating, but it's, it's on the list. Um, so after I get the piece textured and after it goes through the firings and the kilns, it comes out, it's this nice white. The next stage after this is just painting on black. So I use something called underglaze, and underglaze is kind of, it's, it's like a glaze, but it doesn't have as much silica as a glaze has, so it doesn't show up, it doesn't fire as shiny, shiny. So that's why the texturing on the outside here is matte, and it's not shiny, shiny like the bowls. It's a different composition, and it's basically, if you just think of it like a like clay paint. So this stage just comes in with taking your fire pieces. This is called bisque wear. So it goes from green wear to bisque wear to finished wear, wear wear, <laughs> um, but bisque wear. So this is basically, you just paint this on, or if you have a wonderful family, you solicit your mother to sit there for hours <laughs> and paint this on. Um, you and, wipe it off. and then wipe it off and then keep doing it. So the glazing and the coloring process, there's about, I would say probably 10 steps to the coloring process alone mm -hmm. from painting on the black glaze, under glaze, wiping it off, painting on the brown, wiping it off, painting on the moss, double checking. Like there's, there's a lot of little stages, but Usually I try to get a lot of my pieces in the studio to this stage. So it kind of looks like a cow. Um, I had an aunt one time ask, are you gonna clean that up? Yeah, I'm, gonna clean, I'm not gonna sell it like that. Um, but I can clean up the underside. But what I wanna do now is I wanna spread and I wanna distribute that black glaze throughout all those little tiny black lines that I painstakingly carved in. So I take a damp sponge and then pretty much it's wiping a little bit and then scrubbing into the sides of all these pieces. So this is a nice thing to do if you're sitting there talking to mom, if you're sitting there watching Netflix. Um, it's just one of those like kind of relaxing long, long stages, but I mean it ends up taking several minutes for each piece. So once you get everything all kind of scrubbed in, going around the handles. This is why it's a lot easier to not put handles on things because <laughs> um, you do have to kind of work around the handle. One of the many reasons why I make large cylinders is because I'm not a huge fan of making handles. It's much but easier to do those when they don't have peels. Yes, and my so dinnerware I do not put peels on. Um, these other things, this guy, um, 
I have a feeling that I'm going to think the mushrooms are a lot less cool when I start coloring them, <laughs> and I have to navigate around them. Um, the mugs actually do go relatively quick because they, I don't put peels on anything that would be used for food. Um, just because they are fragile, they do occasionally break, um, and I just don't want to get ceramics into somebody's coffee. So once that gets rubbed in, so that's, we're up to two stages now, two steps. Apply the black, scrub it in. Then you come back with a clean sponge and you very slowly wipe it away. And this is when having used those ribs during the trimming process is really important because if you don't have a smooth clay body when you go to wipe that black off you're going to get roughness it's not going to wipe off clean where if it's nice and smooth like that it wipes off pretty clean which is nice um, but this is kind of a you know long a long process just trying to get that perfect so that happens to every single piece so that's three stages next I don't have the other colors with me today, but um, because that one didn't have peels on it. But underneath all of the peels, I have the brown. There's two different colors of brown that go into that. So after this stage, sorry, it's okay. It's applying light brown, applying dark brown, blending them together with a sponge, and then wiping them off. So that's another four stages. So we're up to four, five, six seven stages so far of just coloring. Then you apply moss, eight stages. Then you pour glaze into the inside, nine stages. Then you dump the glaze out, 10 stages. Then you clean up the rim from where you may have dripped glaze all over the place. So it, it's a lot of stages. There's a lot that goes into kind of finalizing that. Should I get your box for that piece? I should. <laughs> <laughs> And, and actually, that's that's a good thing to kind of bring up too. It's it's very difficult to price ceramics, I think, because a lot of it, especially the way that I do it, it's all it's all my time that goes into it, and um, it's very difficult to value your own time when you're like, yeah, yeah, you know, whatever, like five bucks an hour, I don't really care. Um, but it's tough to kind of put put a number on. Okay, this takes me, you know, it's a thirty-two dollar mug. Out of that. You know, there's four dollars, five dollars worth of materials. There's charges for firing. There's charges for you know the the glaze cost. There's um, five minutes to throw it, three minutes to trim it. You know, ten minutes to texture it. Uh, there's a lot of little stages that go into it, and that has definitely been one of I think my biggest challenges as a new like a new artist. Um, when I first started selling mugs, I was like, ah, two for 20, you know, whatever, I don't know. Um, but now I've kind of learned that, okay, it's when you're in business for yourself and when you're working for yourself, you really have to value your time a lot differently than you would in a traditional job. Um, because a lot of this is, yeah, you know, this is a dollar's worth of clay, but by the time I finish it, it's going to be, you know, an hour, two hours worth of work. So that's kind of that's one of those things that I'm I'm learning slowly um, is how how to value time and how to value art. That I look at something and I'm like I'm gonna pay thirty bucks for a mug. Like I'll get like fifty cents at the you know at a uh, yard sale. But looking at it as art and looking at it as something different, and looking at it as you know this is this is a piece of my time um, and this is something that I made because I wanted to share with people. Um, kind of helps helps put a number on things. So that's, it's definitely tricky and definitely like when it gets to a stage of like, I love putting little branches, little mushrooms on things, but every single one of these mushrooms is handmade, individually attached. It's all gonna be individually painted and colored and that's when you know, the time aspect comes in. Um, but I think at the end of the day, I still, I'm, I'm tired but I'm happy. Um, and that's good. It's it's nice being back at the library for a little bit. I'm here about one day a week because it kind of gives me that break where I'm not using my hands <laughs> for once, so I can just kind of like, you know, give my hands a break um, and just kind of give the brain a break because when you're sitting there and you're just trying to like 
I need every single peel to look creative and artistic. It kind of fries your brain after a little while. Um, so I think I've got a good mix going on right now, but um, it's fun. It's, it's really exciting. It's exciting to be able to look at what I've made and look back on my year and know that I'm kind of making my own way with my own hands or with my own ideas. Um, and I think it's a big help and a big thanks to a lot of my fans who are here. Um, <laughs> Because the support just over the years has just helped me realize that I, I can be an artist. Um, I can be a potter. I can take something that I've been passionate about for years and never really acted on and make it into something. Um, and part of that even goes back to soul pine pottery. Um, one of the things mom always says is you have to do what makes your soul happy. And always kind of joked about how I always wanted to be an artist. If anybody like asked me, oh, what do you want to be? I don't know, I want to be like a traveling artist or a crazy person. <laughs> I'm a little bit of both. Um, so that worked out, but it was a little bit of a play on words doing like, you know, the pine trees and the trees that surround my house, the sole pine, the, the singular pine that's just kind of standing alone and trying its own thing. And then also soul pine, what my soul is pining for, um, what I'm yearning for, what is driving me. Um, so it's, it's, it's a dream and it's starting to come true and I'm excited for opportunities like this that I can kind of share, share my excitement and share my enthusiasm with everybody and um, I thank you all for coming out tonight and also for all of your support through my many shows and fairs and craft fairs <laughs> and um, even just saying hi at the library when I'm sitting there, you know, just needing coffee. Um, but. Uh, no, so thank you all, and if you have any other questions, please let me know. I do have some pieces available for sale here. If there's anything that you're interested in, please take a look. Um, so do you do a second firing after you put on the... I do, yeah. So that's... Um, the second firing is a hotter temperature, so when I fire to the first... The first firing is like 1,945 degrees Fahrenheit. And then I apply all the glazes and the underglaze, and then it goes back in for about 2240 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so each piece does get fired twice. So that's that's another consideration that goes into it. Is, and did um, I understand like the white? That's not a glaze. That's the white is not a glaze. Yep. So when the piece is finished, the black shows it pretty well. This is unglazed on the outside. The inside is watertight. Um, it's watertight, it's a durable glaze. Um, it is food safe, so anything like the mugs or the bowls, it is food safe. They are actually microwave safe. I recommend hand washing just because this is a porous material on the outside, so if you wash it and then put it on a wood countertop, bad things are gonna happen to your wood countertop. Mm -hmm. So I recommend hand washing and then letting them dry thoroughly. Um, for the most part, it's a pretty clean glaze. It's a matte glaze, so it doesn't really show if it gets scratched or anything. I mean, there it's a rugged, it's pretty rugged clay. Um, so there's not a lot that you can do aside from dropping it that's gonna damage it. Um, but the outside is porous, but that is completely unglazed. So if you feel them when they're up here, it's the same feel that you're gonna have on these other pieces that have no glaze on them whatsoever. Um, so that's like a bisque? This is a bisque. Mm -hmm. This is like a bisque. Yeah, like the a outside bisque. is like a bisque. Yes, exactly. So how long, if you wash it, how long does it take the outsides to dry it for us? Until it's dry. <laughs> <laughs> so it could take a little while. It could take a little while. Um, if you put it in the dishwasher it's where it's in a position so where it's been it'll saturated, be it'll take longer to dry. Um, but I mean, if, if you just leave it upside down an hour or two, right. I mean, about a little longer than the average for if you had. Tell, so tell them about personalizing your birches and oh yeah, that's another thing I've done. You do about. for custom orders and like the little ones that you did for that wedding. Oh yeah, that was that was fun. Um, last year I made 80 of these for a wedding, and they all had this little heart on the outside that was engraved with B plus A. Um, I have a piece. I'll I'll have to dig it out in a couple minutes. Um, I've done. I think it's in the plastic bag. I've done customizing. So if you have like weddings, baby showers, that type of thing. I've done a lot of wedding gifts that have, you know, like the heart, and like Molly plus Alex equals love, you know, that type of stuff. Um, and they're really fun to do. I like being able to make personalized pieces. Um, I've actually, I had two people pick pieces up earlier um, today, which was fun, and I'm shipping out a couple more this week. Um, 
So that's another thing that's kind of neat, that being able to make personalized pieces for people and things that are really, you know, made for them. Um, I love doing what I do and I love being able to share that and making it custom and kind of making them special is, uh, is exciting. I mean, I'll dig it out later. Molly, when you were at Maine and you made the colors, the three colors, yep. with all the chemicals, was there somebody there that knew, like a chemist who knew what cup, what things you mix <laughs> so you don't get an explosion or something? There was a Google. <laughs> um, I, uh, I have, I, I guess I should say, I, I have mixed glazes before. Um, in college, I, I know, I know mixing glazes. Um, it's not mixing part, chemicals, it's mixing colors. It's mixing colorants and different chemicals. Not a lot of what I'd be working with is very volatile. Um, the worst that's going to happen is that it melts too quickly or looks funky in the kiln, but it's not like you're mixing and you're going to make an explosion. Um, no, the worst thing would be you don't really The worst care. thing would be inhaling it. So a lot of what's in it, it's um, they're ground, ground clay bodies, ground silica. That's why I wear the mask because you don't want to inhale the, I mean, it's, it's powder. It's a it's baby powder consistency silica. So you don't want to inhale that. Um, a lot of the things that make glazes really beautiful are heavy toxic metals. Um, reds are usually like, like irons and cadmium, I think. Um, copper carbonate. Um, there's, there's a lot of different things that go into them. So I think the blues in here come from cobalt carbonate um, with other colorants. So some of the most <coughs> volatile things that you're going to work with are just the, the colorants. But you're working in 10 grams at a time, maybe three grams at Thank a time. You. So yeah, I'm not a, I'm not making like you know crazy crazy explosives. Mm. Um, nothing's going to explode, and it's all. The only thing you have to worry about is just eye irritation and um, lung irritation. That's why you wear you wear the uh, the, the masks. And there was a um, reader was the um, the studio assistant who was there, and he would pretty much like if you came up and handed him a glaze recipe and was like, "Hey, does this work?" Um, glaze mixing is kind of like baking. You can't just throw a whole bunch of stuff into a bowl and then expect, expect it to be a souffle because you want it to be. Um, there are very specific recipes that you follow in very specific orders and very specific concentrations. So um, glaze experimenting is more they like 0.2% more cobalt carbonate than this one with like 0.6% more rutile. Um, you're making very, very small changes. but. Um, yeah, no, no big explosions at all. Okay, thank so, you. Yeah, yep. I stay safe. It's it's there's definitely um, a studio protocol to stay very safe. But it's a very fun process though. Um, and then to answer your question about the, the milk bottles, this is a shape that I've been wanting to try for a while, um, because I wanted to have something else at the shows to sell that wasn't just the birches, because not everybody is a tree person, and I don't know why, but. Um, <laughs> I had been doing more of the stump style, but I realized that the stumps and the birches are both very, very labor intensive. And sometimes when you're just realizing, I have a three day show that's in a week and a half, I need pieces. Um, I wanted to make something that I could kind of crank out pretty quick and then maybe do some fun glaze experiments on, um, try some different combinations. And that's where the milk bottles came in. Um, I had one of these that I made in North Carolina that I just really liked the style. It was kind of inspired by like a vintage milk bottle. And I think I'm going to try making them in three different sizes. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of for the fun of it. Just for something a little bit different. How many color it have you? I don't know yet. Um, one thing I am going to do is the stamp that's on here has a little, I've got these little leaves, I've got oh, these I other see. like little textures and patterns. Mm -hmm. This will be the same rusty red that's on the outside of those pieces just to kind of continue that theme so it'll be this like kind of brownish mm -hmm. red and then other than that I'm I'm not sure I might kind of experiment I might do some that are just plain colors um, I might try out some new glazes I am all out of my watershed mm -hmm. glazes um, I, thought, I think I've got about that much left of each one and I'm saving them but that's something that I want to make make more of these glazes because I'm really I'm really happy with how these turned out and um, I'd love to do more with that so the milk bottles will kind of be a, a glaze exploration for me just something else that it's a pretty plain shape um, but I think I can have some really interesting things happen with the glaze and 
something a little simpler and a little less labor intensive than the birches. Yeah. So, yeah, and they're kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Uh -huh. Should be kind of fun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I did like a half pound, pound and a half, three pounds. So, <laughs> you think you put those on the table and serve milk? Oh, you could, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, so that's what I've got. Yeah, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.